While I was out driving around trying to tune the Hyundai, I slowly cooked one of my axles. At least I think it's an axle because it's how this video is starting. Well, so we're gonna go with that. But I think this is because it's leaking all over the place. It's all over my wheels, just causing the Plasti Dip to start bubbling and separating from the wheel and collecting just about every kind of dirt, sand, gravel, and grime you can discover on a public road. Of course, it's always helpful to remove your lug nuts prior to jacking up the car, but, but there will still be those times when you don't. Jack stands have multiple uses. Anyway, I noticed smoke rising after doing some hard pulls. I didn't see it again for a long time, and then during a traffic jam one day when I was barely moving at all, I saw a whole lot of smoke coming from this wheel. I thought someone was barbecuing or something. I said, oh Lord Jesus, it's a fire. With all the oil, grease, paint, and other flammables involved, I figured it was time to fix this leaky axle once and for all. But never mind the fire hazard, because this axle is too disgusting, even for me. I decided to take the extra time to clean all this axle spooge off of everything using some of my leftover mineral spirits. Many of you who saw the DIY parts washer video already know what I'm doing. It's a short video with no talking. Check the description. Whatever doesn't get removed by spraying mineral spirits on it will come loose with a little bit of nylon brush persuasion. Then you blow everything off with compressed air. This stuff not only cuts through dirt, grease, wax, adhesives, asphalt, bugs, oil, blood, excrement, and whatever else can airy easily. When you're finished with it, it leaves behind a bone dry surface that's ready for paint, undercoating, or whatever the next thing is that it decides to explode inside your wheel well. Mineral spirits is one of the many kinds of paint thinners, but it doesn't remove most kinds of paint once they're dried. It just cleans up auto paint. But one of the kinds of dried paints that it's really good at thinning is Plasti Dip. Sure, you can peel Plasti Dip, that's one way to remove it. But over time it gets harder to peel, and some people paint over Plasti Dip with clear coats or other things. Once you do that, you can't peel it anymore. It sort of cements it in place. Well, you can see right here what mineral spirits do to it. Now, with that out of the way, I just have to do one of the most common jobs you ever see me do here, and that's pulling an axle back out, again. Aside from removing the wheel, it's just a cotter pin and two nuts between you and removing your axle. You can see how fast this wheel well dried up. It's completely degreased. Missed a spot. Yuck. Oh well. Sometimes a Hyundai lets me easily separate ball joints, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it helps to use a jack to lift the hub so that it spring loads the lower control arm, and sometimes it doesn't. Usually you can shock the tapered post once with a hammer and it lets go. But other times you beat on it for a long time and have to go retrieve special tools in order to separate it. This style of ball joint separator costs about 20 bucks. It fits 1G cars and it gives you all the mechanical advantage you need if you ever encounter this problem. Plus it does it without tearing the boot on your ball joint any worse than it already is. I should have grabbed it first, but the other methods work so well I usually don't need it. So if the axle pulled out of the hub, I just use a shorty pry bar to free the inner joint from the transmission. And this is what I've got to work with. If you separated the inner joint accidentally, you can massage it back into place. Aside from the gooey boot on the outer joint, the axle looks and feels fine. However, the noises that I hear when I turn the wheel don't lie. This joint's on its way out. But I've had an idea of brewing for a while that I think is overdue here. Oh, it's only half of it. When I bought this, I was told it was the whole axle for a 1.6 liter Mirage. It's not. This is the outer shaft for a 90 to 96 turbo all-wheel drive Eclipse, and it's missing the inner jack shaft. I have it. Just have to get that sucker off. <laughs> Way too long. What I'm seeing isn't pretty. It's a whole lot longer. No good. Let's get this thing inside on the workbench and take a closer look at it. On the front wheel drive axle, there's two CV joints. You get an inner joint and an outer joint, one on each end of the axle. There's a seal boss in the transmission side of the axle that keeps all your transmission oil inside the case where it belongs. Well, I cleaned this all-wheel drive jack shaft up on the wire wheel and oiled it. I'm supposed to have a seal boss on the end of the jack shaft. I'm supposed to. I suppose there was one here before it rusted out and evaporated. I can't fix this, and no matter how hard I tried, I could not separate the axle cup from the jack shaft to get an accurate measurement. You're just supposed to be able to beat on the back edge with a plastic mallet to separate it. I used every hammer I had. I put flat spots all the way around it. I don't need it, so I beat the daylights out of it. It's rusted on there good. Since my spare was toast, I contacted Performance Part Out and replaced the whole thing. It's used. Nobody's making new ones, and this one looks better. The carrier bearing's definitely good on this one. Loving that. 
splines are okay too. It just has a little bit of age and crust on it that I'm going to clean up before putting it back to use. Just a little old grease, rust, and scale to remove, but now with this thing in hand, I can get a more accurate measurement of the differences between these two axles. What I want to do here is clamp down a backstop on the workbench so that I can fully compress the axle and mark its length on my workbench. I want the all-wheel drive axle to follow its fitment because I need that specific amount of play in the joint to prevent it from destroying my transmission or binding the axle and snapping it when the suspension travels. The outer joint is stationary, but the inner joint of both axles is basically a slip joint. With the first axle marked on the workbench, it's time to assemble the all-wheel drive axle. I made sure that I drove the jack shaft all the way into the axle. So with the two shafts joined and fully compressing them on the workbench, I made my second mark. <laughs> so you do, I mean, <laughs> Here, here's why I did this. These things, yes, just those. That's why I did this. I got a ruler that's in both American and Canadian. It looks like we've got 28, nope, 27 mils, or one and one eighth inch. Gotta shorten that axle one and one eighth inch. This axle. For the record, this one, the brand new one, one and one eighth inch. True story, I went to the local drive shaft shop and I've been dealing with them for decades and I totally never knew that I wouldn't be able to get a CV axle shortened there. They just do drive shafts and they, they're great at that. But this really changed my options. The axle here on the bench is already a custom axle. For now, I think I just need to find another way to repair the axle that I have. But I haven't given up on this idea of using an all-wheel drive jack shaft and a shortened CV outer axle. For multiple reasons, that just has to happen. I don't know where to get this whole outer joint assembly all by itself, but having a bin full of spare axle parts nearby certainly keeps me from lifting a finger to look any harder for it. If I'm able to get this axle apart, perhaps there's a way that I can fix this custom axle because it uses the exact same outer joint as all the other axles that I have in that bin. So after the boot's cut off, I'm supposed to just be able to knock the joint apart with a brass punch. But that was not my experience with it at all. I need something beefier than a brass punch that lets me apply force to both sides of the inner bearing race so that I can drive it off the splines evenly. Beating on it with my good brass punch is just destroying my punch. I think this is going to do. If I take the grip off my jack handle and then grab an angle grinder and cut a one inch wide slot in it, cut that chunk out, and then cut an angle into the tip of it, then I can, uh, I, I get this, uh, this horseshoe like shaped. Hmm. did it the wrong way. I can fix that. I'm an idiot sometimes. You don't need to watch me fix that. So now instead of hitting it on only one tiny little point on one side of the inner race, I have a wedge-shaped punch of a pipe thing that distributes the blow all the way around more than half of the race. It makes pretty efficient use of hammer strokes. This takes pretty much all the complication out of this process because now I don't even have to mess with the inner joint. I can put a new boot on and put a new joint on and that's a great segue into the next scene where we have yet another one of these things that looks just like the same thing we were already working on. This is the outer shaft from another totally different all-wheel drive axle that someone separated the inner joint on for me and already here. In other words, this one has the actual shaft that I'd need to shorten on the brand new axle that I already have that we were just looking at, if that were possible. But the most important thing it has is a new outer joint that's perfectly good. It feels absolutely fantastic. I have to have that thing. The clamps pop apart easiest with the screwdriver. I don't know why I got so overzealous earlier with the side cutters. I'm just cleaning up some of the excess grease before we do the exact same thing that we just did a minute ago. Use that nifty CV joint separator to easily knock the outer joint off. I 
just mangled the clip, and that still didn't stop her. I don't need it anyway. Don't do it, Jaffro. Don't. Oh man, you just had to, didn't you? Gross. There's my CD axle joint shaft separator tool, also known as a floor jack handle. Hey, don't judge. I needed a thing that I didn't have, so I made it. Squish the grip back on it, and nobody will ever know the difference. Now it's like a Swiss Army jack. At this point, I just needed to clean up the good CV joint and see what we've got to work with. You just use cheap paper towels here. Don't waste all your shop rags throwing away grease. Taking the CV joint apart is easy. You just articulate the inner race 90 degrees upwards and start pulling all your balls out. Once they're all out, and it can take a while, you can remove the inner race. That can get tricky, and I'll show you why after all this is cleaned up. Paper towels are cheaper than solvent, but there's nothing wrong with saving a little squirt of it for last. I'm not gonna bother with removing the ball retainer. It's kind of pointless. Can I call it that? Ball retainer? It's a ball retainer. I've just clocked it so that you can see the grooves inside the outer race where the balls go and how pristine and wonderful those grooves are. Seriously, they all look new. Now, note the shape of the holes in the ball retainer. Notice how some of them are ovals and two of them are rectangular. If you clock the inner race at 90 degrees to the ball retainer, you can fit one of its teeth inside of that rectangular hole to insert and remove it from the assembly. That's how you do that. Now, to put it all back together, start with the inner race. You can see how I had to align a tooth in the ball retainer here, and then you just roll the other side into place. On this axle, the side of the inner race that faces away from the joint is the pointy eccentric side. The flat side faces in. I don't think it matters on the retainer, but I treated that one the same way. It had a flatter edge, and I put that on the inside as well. Now you can start putting all your balls back in the retainer. I start with two on the same side, and after those are sorted, I do the opposite two. With those four in place, the last two are easier to install without launching the other ones back out. It gets more and more difficult to rotate the inner race around until you have all six of them in place. Then it should move smoothly. You don't need to grease all this stuff as you put it back together, just put it together dry. I've got a solution for you that once it's all assembled, uh, I can't believe I had this like new outer joint just laying in my scrap pile waiting to save the Hyundai. That was fortunate. I bought a boot kit. Don't bother with that part number. It's a totally wrong part and it's 2020 so this is just more of the same old kind of thing. Pretty numb to it now. You'll see me figure it out in a minute. Yeah, it comes with a bag of grease, a few clamps, some snap ring clips that I totally don't need for anything, and instructions that I'm not going to bother reading. But anyway, it's all I'm supposed to need to put the axle back in service. The boot needs to go on before the outer joint, and I'm going to clean up and prep the axle splines here to make sure nothing's munched. I'll give it a 95%. Where am I going to get a replacement for it anyway? I have to use this thing. The boot goes on, and now I have to grease the joint. There are super messy ways to do this, and there are more difficult, time-consuming, and expensive, super clean ways to do it. And I don't care about any of that. I'm gonna go for the fastest, free, and tidiest way I can do it. Just cut a half inch off the corner of the grease bag, put it in your fist, stick the whole of the grease bag down in the hole of the inner race, and squeeze it until it squirts out of all six sides. Then fill the rest of the center up with the rest of the grease, and. When you jam the axle into the joint, it's gonna displace more of that grease and push more of it out. So just line up the axle splines with the inner race and tap it all the way on until the compression clip locks into place. Now's the point in time where Jaffro rides the struggle bus for real. Unhappy. I'm unhappy. It's the wrong boot. Really, no biggie. I just happened to have made a tool for this, specifically this. I harvested the boot off the same axle that this new joint came from because it was completely fine too. I just cleaned it up real good inside and out, and there's no reason these parts can't live to fight another day and slew of battles. It turns out that the only thing that I needed from the boot kit was the grease. I'm not even going to use those band clamps. I can't stand that kind. For about 30 bucks, you can get two different kinds of axle clamp tools that come with eight extra band clamps. I prefer to use plier style clamps just because I'm lazy. To me, they're just easier to work with. You can install these style clamps by hand with no special tools, hold them in place, and just give them a pinch at the end to seal the deal. 
just make sure to stretch it as tight as possible to get the tab in the last hole that it can reach before that pinch. If you do that, it's hard to get it wrong. This rubber thing is called a dampener. Whether or not it actually does what it's called, I couldn't tell you, but I, I put it back where I found it. Now for the outermost clamp, and I get to use the big one. You get one shot at lining all this up, so make sure you've got the whole circumference of the boot and clamp right where you want them. Then give it a massive pinch, but sometimes it doesn't want to pinch and you take the thing off and you give it a stern talking to and you do it again and it works that time. Probably not supposed to beat on it like I'm doing, but I don't want a big metal thing sticking out and spinning, you know what I'm saying? So there you have it, non-seizing, non-leaky, non-fire hazard axle. It only cost me 10 bucks for a boot kit. And all I used was the grease, thanks to my rat hold hoard of spare axle bits and some skin off my cutoff wheel and my jack handle. Axle problems fixed. You're probably asking what the other joint looked like that came off the axle shaft. Like, what gave you the idea that this was a real fire hazard? Well, it was awfully difficult to move around, and you'll see as this attempt at disassembly progresses that I'm using tools that I didn't have to use on the good one at all, not to take it apart, nuh-uh. And it just gets progressively more and more ridiculous as the video goes on. Things that you're not supposed to see happen on a workbench. And that thing did not want to come apart. Seriously, there was over 160 gigabytes of video of me struggling to remove two balls that were seized into the outer joint. At what point do you stop? My efforts took longer than a whole memory card, but I finally got it. And here we go. The first sign of the CV joint being bad was how hard it was to take apart. With the last ball out, I can clean this up real quick to help you get a better look at it. Immediately, I can see that the ball retainer shows lots of wear. See the shiny spots on the outer side of the retainer? They're almost discolored. That's bad on this part. It's supposed to stay floating freely without any contact in this thing, so shiny spots mean there's some deflection in this joint for it to have been loaded up like that. You can see shiny discolored spots also on the race that supports the retainer. And I can also see that there's some flat spots worn where the balls go in the outer race of the joint too. There's some discoloration on the leading thrust edges of those races, and that indicates heat damage and lubrication failure. Well, that's a logical problem to have if the boot failed. Contaminated grease will cause that, but I still don't think it's the whole story. The wear is pretty severe if the ball retainer's touching down and polishing itself smooth. It moves pretty freely without interference, snags or a hang-up, so let's keep looking. If you want to take the retainer out, just align the rectangular holes with the meaty sides of the outer race and it slides right out. Doesn't make a difference either way, but I suppose it's a little easier to clean if you remove it. Where I found the most destruction of the innards of this CV joint was between the ball retainer and the inner race. The inner race is really munged. Feeling around the edges of the inner race, I was able to discover a bit of mushrooming effect caused by an absolutely massive torque load being applied to a hot overloaded inner race. The heat and load changed the shape of the inner race so that it binds and hangs up now. That's why it wouldn't move freely. That's why I had to beat the living daylights out of it to take it apart. This really kind of explains a lot. Rather certain I found the heat source that cooked that wheel. But it's not the end of my efforts here on the front end of the Hyundai. Whatever happened up here blistered and cooked the paint off of the caliper. And they're 30 years old and that can't be good for the seals either. I think I gotta do something with that. My suspension bottoms out at high speeds on small imperfections in the road, for instance, on bridge joints, and I need a little bit more suspension travel than these Mirage struts provide me with. And I've got a set of DSM struts that I'd like to change over to. They should increase my spring rate a little bit, and it's likely to change a whole lot more of the geometry of the front end all over again. I've already got videos about what it involves to do that on this car, and I really don't feel like making that video again, at least not the same way. It's the same thing that I had to do the Mirage struts. I, I can't just bolt struts onto this car. I have to modify them to fit first. This is all about making it a safer car. It's nice to show you that if you have old busted axles that between 10 and 40 bucks, depending on whether or not you own the set of pliers, that you can rebuild your own axle or even replace the joint yourself. It can cost 10 times that to replace, so hopefully demonstrating how easy it is to change the outer joints out might help someone else get out of a pinch someday. Suddenly your scrap pile looks like a gold mine, doesn't it? For instance, this busted old outer joint will live on to support the wheel bearings of my rollers while they're waiting for their engines. Just slap one of these blanks into the hub and torque it down and now you won't destroy your wheel bearings or have a wheel fall off while pushing it around. 
Preserving your bearings is putting money back in your wallet and time on your watch. They'll be just as fresh as you left them when it's time to put them back to use again. Whenever you're working on antique custom parts, aside from making new ones, your options for replacement are pretty limited. It's nice to preserve them, especially if you figure out a way to do it for free. This old axle shaft isn't going to last me forever, and I know this. This might be worth making a video about when I have to replace it. But forget all that suspension and brake crap. That stuff takes hours to produce. I've done it before, so it's redundant, and it's tedious to edit. I'm not a fan of welding around camera equipment anyway, and it's supposed to only be 40 degrees outside this week. Plus, the hard drive space that it would take is just ridiculous with this kind of 4K and 5.2K content. I don't want to waste everyone's time waiting for the video of me showing you a neat trick to save some money repairing your outer axle joints. I don't want anybody to have to wait for that. You know, where's this voiceover going anyway? You don't care about any of these YouTube problems. All you want is a video to like and a channel to subscribe to. Maybe a reason to join Patreon because I put everything from that right back into my channel and I've proved every last bit of that to the IRS. But anyway, now that it's properly fueled and now that I've fixed the axle that I broke, I can keep making other improvements to this car to make it better. Don't be surprised if I decide to make a video still improving further on some of the changes to my brakes and suspension parts being upgraded to improve this car's traction, drivability, ride quality, and braking. I'll probably have to redo everything again, but you know, it'll be worth it. You'll see. Uh, what? Oh, I already made that? It's just, it, it's just finishing up now? Wow. No, no way. That took like two days, man. The editing's done too? Seriously, though. And forget all the jibber jabber, let's drive this thing! badly out of alignment and it wants to put you in a ditch if you mash on it, but I have adjustment left everywhere for that. The steering wheel is cocked too, but these are just tweaks. I can fix all of this. The hardest, least replaceable part is already done and that's behind me. The custom axle miraculously managed to get fixed. Everything else you saw at the end I can easily buy and modify at home to keep this old girl alive. The stance is absolutely just perfect now with these parts. She's sitting even keeled again, the front springs are preloaded, the perches haven't been hammered for clearance, and I've got a ton of clearance. That's awesome. There's like an extra inch here for tire from just from using the 1G DSM strut, even with the same springs. And it's because of the spring preload. I'm talking room for tire on both length and width. This will fix my speedometer calibration as well, and hopefully deliver enough traction for the amount of power this car is capable of making. This car, more than any other in my driveway, really needed this. I already had every bit of tire that the Mirage Colt Elantra strut would allow, and there are almost 130,000 of you following me who could have told me at any time that I was wasting my time with that strut all along, but nope. Now we all know. Plenty of room in the comments for advice or I told us those. Sometimes it's the $10 axle fix video that turns into a complete front suspension and braking replacement. I've got a lot of logs in the fire right now, and I'll be back again soon with another episode, so stay tubed.